while we're waiting for everybody to uh, get going. I know uh, you all had to register to get the link to get in tonight, but I'll put in a shameless plug for uh, the Oregon AFL CIO and the University of Oregon Labor Education Research Center's summer series. I just put the link in the uh, chat box for everybody who's here. Uh, we're gonna be hosting a series of uh, workshops on some of the biggest issues facing our labor movement here in Oregon and uh, really across the country. We've got national experts, we've got some of our homegrown experts, and we've got activists from around the state who are gonna be joining us to talk about um, these issues over the course of the summer. I'll put the registration link in the chat box. Feel free to uh, share with your uh, colleagues, your coworkers, your uh, fellow unionists, and get them uh, involved in the conversation. Uh, as I said before, my name is Mark Brenner. I work at the University of Oregon's Labor Education Research Center. Very happy to be the first host tonight for our uh, ongoing summer series. Uh, I'm joined tonight by two uh, frontline healthcare workers who are gonna be telling us the inside story of COVID-19. Um, we're gonna get started in just a second, uh, but I wanted to welcome you all and thank you for being here. Uh, for those of you who haven't really done too many Zoom uh, webinars, um, or been on too many Zoom calls. So first, count yourself lucky. For those of us who've done a lot of them, they are uh, something special. And but is this the new reality that we're living in? We wanna make sure that we're reaching out and helping uh, strengthen the Oregon labor movement here. Uh, so uh, the way that we're gonna be taking questions and, and uh, comments tonight is uh, primarily through the chat function. You can chat all of the panelists and uh, you can also uh, uh, get us questions that you wanna ask. We're going to spend about the first half hour hearing from our, our panelists uh, about the very, uh, very, the very big differences in some cases between the situation uh, in, in here in Oregon and, and New York City and a lot of similarities as we'll discover. Um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and get us started just because we're going to try and stick to our time. and We're going to do these series uh, every two weeks starting this week uh, for about an hour. It's uh, really designed to kind of bring you in get you some information that you can use and get you going. Um, so uh, inside the, 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 the COVID crisis, that is what we are working on tonight. That is, that is the panel that we are gonna get, that we're gonna get started on. Uh, I'm gonna kick us off with just a few kind of um, uh, fundamental kind of uh, picture of, the, of where we are uh, right now. And, um, let me just make sure if I'm in the right place. Um, so let me, uh, let me just share my screen again, make sure we're getting going. Um, and I thought it would be a, a good place to just to sort of paint a quick picture of what's been going on with uh, COVID-19. Obviously for many of us, we've been sheltered at home. Uh, we've been uh, trying to figure out this uh, new and very uh, dangerous virus as it spread, and especially I think uh, here in Oregon, it's felt a little bit like the waiting game. When are we going to, well, you know, when are things going to get bad? We've watched the news, we've seen what's been happening on TV. Um, so this is the picture of, of, of COVID cases uh, state by state. As of today, uh, you can see, of course, New York is uh, really still the, New York, New Jersey, the Northeast, they are still the, the place where we've had the, the hardest hit areas. Um, but we start to see in the South, Louisiana, um, Arizona, that the cases are expanding. And really, uh, as the Harvard Global Health Institute has uh, started to track, the risk of, uh, of COVID uh, infection is um, really rising in a lot of parts of the country. Now, here in Oregon, not quite. Uh, but um, I just wanted to leave you with uh, two, two last thoughts, um, uh, which is, uh, if we're going to successfully um, be able to contain COVID or even suppress it enough so that we can start to really safely reopen the economy. Uh, experts have estimated that um, testing and tracing are gonna be the foundation of doing that contact tracing. Uh, and I just wanted to just give you the picture for the way we look here in Oregon right now. Uh, we've done about 305,000 tests since COVID started. Uh, Judy uh, and the folks in New York can attest that they are way ahead of us. They've done about uh, uh, 5 million almost. Um, and according to the Harvard experts, um, in order to just mitigate the virus, we're probably just be able to safely sort of slow its spread 
we're going to need to be testing about 146 people per 100,000 every day here in Oregon. And if we really want to suppress it, if we really want to try and squash the virus, our testing and contact tracing, we need to be testing about uh, 519 people here in the state. So uh, Oregon is lagging a lot of states in terms of testing, even though our caseload's not very high. Uh, we're definitely at risk for outbreak. Um, so just to give you a clear picture of what that might look like, I want to uh, hand the, the screen over to um, Judy Sheridan Gonzalez. Judy is the president of the New York State Nurses Association. Uh, she's a, a longtime friend and ally. We've worked together for many years and I'm very happy to have you here. Uh, so Judy's gonna paint us a picture of what New York, the epicenter of COVID-19 has been through. So Judy, please take it away. Oh, thank you, Mark, and hello to uh, brothers and sisters in Oregon, far away. Uh, thank you for having us uh, on your program. So in New York, back in early March, uh, we uh, heard that we might be having a case. I think it was March 1st, we might have gotten our first case. But prior to that, we had our eyes on Wuhan, China, uh, very concerned about what was going on there. Although we've heard of avian flu and SARS and other uh, kinds of infections, Ebola, we weren't sure what was going to hit us. But as an organization, we felt it was really critical, as we had done with Ebola and with some of the other uh, infections that were coming, that we were inundated with, uh, we said we really need to be prepared. So we confronted, uh, as a union in our various uh, bargaining units, we represent 42,000 nurses in the state of New York. And we have about, oh, 150 or so contracts, separate contracts, not all one contract, because hospital after hospital got organized separately. Uh, we have public and private sector as well. Uh, we started to confront the employers and ask, what was your plan for preparation? Uh, do you be beefing up your staffing? Are you uh, creating new beds? Are you getting us the PPE? Every, everyone knows the PPE is on this call, Mark? Any you might explain equipment? to me, this is the broad union crowd. Pers so. uh, personal protective equipment, uh, such as masks and shields and gowns and the things that uh, we knew that we had to wear to protect ourselves from this kind of microorganism. Uh, our belief at the time <clears throat> was that it was airborne, meaning through the air, the virus would travel through the air, much like tuberculosis. Uh, there, I'm sure you've heard of things like airborne, droplet, what does that mean? Uh, droplets are bigger, just it's a size. It's really size and travel speed. A tiny little virus can travel farther, sit in the air longer. A big fat droplet, like a sneeze, something you can see, uh, goes kind of a couple of feet and then kind of drops to the ground, which is why they call it droplet. There's different types of equipment that are necessary to protect you against these kinds of things. We were sure it was airborne and needed these special masks called N95, which maybe you've heard of. N95 means it protects you against 95% uh, of the microorganisms. Well, the hospitals were not cooperating with us. In fact, uh, we are a very militant union and we don't usually, uh, are not seen as cooperating with the employer very much because they're pretty vicious. But this time we actually said, hey, Let's put in bygones be bygones. This is like a Martian invasion. You know, let's man the balustrades together and deal with this, this illness. And they kind of refused. They're always talking about cooperation. This time they really weren't willing to cooperate. They said, oh, we have a plan, we're prepared. Meanwhile, just like the rest of you, we were facing a very austere situation with budget cuts. Our hospitals were cut, Medicaid reimbursement was cut, Medicaid reimbursement was cut, uh, especially in our poorer communities, in our communities of color. So we were already way behind the eight ball before it started. So as I said, around March 1st, we got our first case. Uh, we were still not getting cooperation from the hospitals and we were not getting good uh, support, obviously from the federal government, none of us have been. Um, so we decided to have a press conference in early March uh, because we found out that the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, which we always believed in and depended upon, uh, was gonna maybe kind of alter their guidelines. What do I mean by that? It's as if, you, um, I think it's sort of like, you know how you have to wear a safety belt in a car to drive. That's a, that's a specific standard. It's a guideline to protect you. Uh, the CDC was finding out that they didn't have enough masks uh, or they were told they didn't have enough masks. Now this virus hit uh, China in December and, and any sensible government would start procuring equipment, ventilators and masks and other kinds of protective equipment. They did not do that. In fact, we found out companies at an exorbitant uh, profit sold 
millions and millions of ventilators and masks to China in the months of January and February. In any case, in March, we demanded that the hospitals and the government start providing and procuring the necessary equipment to protect us uh, as caregivers because we were reading reports of Chinese people dying like flies and healthcare workers in particular. Now, I, you've probably heard that disease mostly affects people with what they call comorbidities. That means other kinds of illnesses, diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, asthma, and the elderly. Uh, we found that the healthcare workers in China were young and healthy, and yet they were succumbing to the disease as well. We felt like we were kind of sitting ducks. Uh, we had a press conference. We were very public about it. The hospitals didn't cooperate. The CDCS, as we expected, had lowered their guidelines. So it's, again, it would be like saying, um, babies should be in child safety seats in the car, but we don't have enough of them. So just put them on your lap and hope for, drive carefully. That was basically the message we were told. We said, that's not acceptable. We're not uh, willing to go along with that, but we had no choice because in a matter of one week, we doubled, tripled, quadrupled, and the amount of patients that came in were 10 times the amount of patients we had. 90% of our patients in a matter of a week or two were COVID positive. Many were really sick. Uh, in the begin in the early period, we probably were taking care of COVID patients and not knowing it. And 80% uh, of us got sick in my particular hospital. We had the highest level, highest number of cases. I'm in the Bronx, where we have a poor community, community of color, people with uh, very poor living conditions who could not social distance and and be protected. So we were inundated. We had to expand ICU tenfold. People who uh, didn't know how to, you know, working in an ICU for those of you who are not in healthcare. Uh, I guess it's like asking somebody who, I don't know what other, like if you work in the transit system and you take tickets, it's telling you, okay, tomorrow, read this book, uh, read, read this thing for two hours, and now you're going to drive the train. That's, that's what it's like to tell, throw people in an ICU, and nurses were just thrown from the OR to clinics to other areas to the ICU and expected to function, which, of course, they couldn't function, uh, so people became very traumatized. So aside from getting sick and dying, we many of our members died, uh, and also worrying about infecting our own families because of the transmission of this virus, which was airborne, as I said, droplet, and also contact. That's why the gel, hand gel business, you know, went up the roof, uh, washing your hands, don't touch your face, all that kind of stuff. People basically were separated from their children. Um, we had to fight for everything. We were actually threatened with discipline for wearing N95 masks in the beginning. And we found out that the only way we could get what we needed was by fighting, organizing, uh, utilizing the press. We used the press a lot. We had press conferences. We had safe distance rallies, protests, letter writing. Uh, and we found out that we could use this Zoom call uh, to pressure the employer. Because we were pressuring the employer. We were putting pressure on the federal government, which was a big reach, but it was getting publicity, and demanding that they implement something called the Defense Production Act which they implemented in World War II to produce items for the war. We said, this is a war against the virus. You need to, you need to force factories to produce items. Uh, we were pro procuring our, <clears throat> our own uh, PPE also for our members. Uh, and we were able to get somewhere. We weren't getting um, housing. We got housing after protesting. We weren't getting uh, food. We got food because you couldn't take these masks off to eat. You couldn't go out, you know. Uh, and of course, getting the PPE, getting the gowns, getting the shields, getting the goggles, uh, getting the Tyvek suits, all the things that we needed to protect ourselves as we started all getting sick. I myself got ill. Uh, everyone I knew got, got ill in the ER. You, you know, and then people were resigning. They were scared. Uh, we wanted other nurses to come and help us, but we felt we wanted to make sure that they were protected to also come. Although the agencies hire, they were paying outrageous amounts of money for travel nurses. In any case, uh, we discovered that uh, the Zoom calls were uh, very useful to us because we were able to inform our members. Uh, and also within the union structure itself, the leadership was meeting every day, twice a day, three times a day, constant information, constant feedback uh, from the very floors on the units, the very shop floor to the head of the union and back down again all along. Uh, getting information, fighting back, getting information, fighting back. And we developed that structure. Uh, for the first two months, we had 300 people on a Zoom call uh, every night in different places all across the state. And that was how we were able to really gather information and give people uh, cues and strategies on fighting back, fighting for the PPE that I mentioned, uh, fighting for hazard pay, for 
uh, you know, the, the cost because we had to find childcare, uh, food, shelter, hotels, because people couldn't go home. Uh, we, we, and then um, uh, scrubs, clothing to wear at work. You were afraid you infect your car. I mean, there were so many pressures on us that we, uh, and everybody was scared. And then people were having mental health issues. Uh, if you lived, you had survivor guilt. I have, I have survivor guilt. Uh, you lose a colleague, a comrade, and you're alive, right? Um, or you're, you know, I lost my brother-in-law. We all lost a family member. We couldn't even mourn. We couldn't have funerals. The stress was horrible. And in the community in which I live, and those of us who live in poorer communities, our, our communities were, were starving. People were suffering from malnutrition. They were unemployed, uh, particularly the undocumented and people who were kind of gig workers. They weren't getting any kind of support. They weren't eligible for unemployment in some cases. Certainly undocumented people weren't. Uh, many undocumented people in our community and uh, the trauma of watching our, our people dying and suffering was overwhelming. Uh, but people felt the union had their back. Uh, the union became really important to all of us. Uh, we started to get uh, a lot of uh, uh, pressure from the government at the same time as respect. They were scared of us because we had a lot of support uh, we were seen as heroes, but we didn't want to be heroes because meant we weren't martyrs. We had, a, we had a statement like heroes, but not martyrs. And as you see the sign behind me, essential, but not expendable. Not only were nurses uh, expendable, but uh, delivery workers, all the people who had to work uh, were the ones who were dying because they weren't getting protection and couldn't, couldn't uh, find the means to protect themselves. So the fight goes on. Uh, we had to fight for sick pay a special sick pay, and now we're having trouble with workers' comp. Uh, clearly, if so many of us got sick, we, we, got, we got COVID at work, uh, the hospitals are, are challenging us to say, we have to pr prove that we got it at work. Well, how do we prove that we got it at work? There was like a, it's like getting hit by a, a crane. You know you got hit by a crane or you fell. This is not the same thing. Over time, you were exposed. It was the intensity of the exposure and the strength of the virus that got us sick. So that's another fight that's going on. And our biggest battle right now is uh, to get legislation to tax the super wealthy. We have incredible income disparity in the state of New York and the city of New York. And if they would change the tax codes, we'd have enough money to feed the hungry, to pay people so they could pay their rent, pay their mortgages, uh, pay people for, uh, for survival, uh, figure out how to rebuild the schools. All the things could be done if the super wealthy would pay their fair share. So those are the things we're focusing on now. Uh, also not loosening. I think in New York, we're actually doing a pretty good job at uh, distancing and because we saw corpses every day. I mean, hundreds of people died every day in our own hospitals. We were, there were so many deaths that we had to ask them to put a canopy in the yard where they would bring the bodies out to the trailers because looking out the window was so demoralizing. That's how many bodies were out there. It was horrible. Uh, we were near hysteria almost all the time. So people were behaving. Now people are coming back from these other states. And I don't know if they're bringing a mutated form of the virus, but now we're concerned we're going to see a surge. And we're fighting for protection yet again. And guess what? Employers are doing the same thing. They're not working with us. So I just feel like every day I wake up and, you know, have nightmares all night and fight all day. But it's, uh, we didn't have a union probably we'd have many more deaths, and I think everybody knows it. Uh, and building solidarity with the other unions is critical. Our construction workers, our transit workers, our delivery workers, all the unions fighting uh, for the same thing. We're uniting together. It's brought us together. Uh, it's, and now with all the, uh, the Black Lives Matter stuff and all the racism that um, is not just manifested in police brutality, which is horrible, but in healthcare and housing and education. Uh, we say in our union, we have three pandemics the COVID pandemic, the racism pandemic, and the austerity pandemic. And they're all interconnected. And that's the fight we're fighting now. And I think we'll be fighting that uh, forever. <laughs> Hopefully one day we'll really win big. Uh, but that's about it. Thank you, Judy. We have a lot of questions, I'm sure, that you sparked up. But as you, as you say, uh, you're coming from New York, where uh, 27,000 people have died from COVID-19. And here in Oregon, we've lost 249 people. The picture is very different. 
Um, now, just to show us how different that is, I'm very excited to introduce uh, Jessica Barnes, uh, ICU nurse uh, at uh, Good Shepherd Community Hospital in Hermiston, Oregon. Uh, Jessica is a member of the Oregon Nurses Association and has also been dealing with COVID outbreak in her community, uh, but in a very different context. So Jessica, why don't you paint us a little bit of a picture of what the, what the pandemic has looked like from Hermiston and uh, just more generally from the vantage point of Oregon? Yeah, um, so I mean, definitely a different kind of, you know, scenario for sure than New York um, as for rural um, Oregon for us. Um, I think that, you know, for we saw a little bit of the COVID early on, um, like I had mentioned before, like late in the late last year. But it wasn't until March um, when we actually got word that, hey, COVID-19 is here in the United States um, and we need to do something about it. Um, once we started getting cases in our little hospital, um, it was kind of like, oh my goodness, you know, we're 25 bed critical access hospital. We might see a ventilator once a month, if that, you know, and, um, you know, we have, we have six beds normally, and we have one room that's usually designated for um, a vent. And usually those are not meant for, um, you know, for ventilatory issues where that requires a pulmonologist. We do not have specialties, um, you know, or specialists in that, in that manner. We usually just do it for airway management. So somebody that might be coming up from, you know, from surgery that might need a little bit of time to recover. Um, but here we are with COVID-19 trying to manage vent, you know, patients that actually have ventilatory needs um, that are experiencing a whole other, you know, types of issues that we are just not used to doing as a tiny little hospital with um, lack of experience, so to speak, in that, um, in that aspect. We're just very much a patch them up, send them and ship them kind of a, kind of a, you know, hospital as most hospitals in Oregon are. Um, so that's how it kind of started. Um, we had to develop our, um, our break room became a patient room. Um, the recovery center down in part of the surgery became a secondary ICU for just in case kind of a situation because, you know, it was like all hands on deck kind of a thing. Um, and just like, um, she was mentioning was they were trying to train these nurses who um do not have any experience in running vents um to you know they're now you're expected to be able to run these vents but you only get one day of training so here it is you know you better show up <laughs> kind of a thing um but you know as it as it goes along um we kind of closed down shop as far as like surgery goes the clinics really kind of shut down a lot of virtual visits were happening um, pay, uh, the community overall were really, really utilizing either their primary care, uh, urgent care, virtual clinics, which is not something that um, our community is really used to. In general, our, I, you know, our ER is pretty hopping, um, you know, for just kind of all sorts of random stuff, as many ERs are. And here we are now, all of a sudden, low sensing even our ER staff, which has never, ever happened. Um, so this is, you know, all of a sudden it was like, now what do we do now? Now, now we are needing to be able to put all these staff on low census because we don't, we don't have patients. We're not doing surgery. Um, so that's our main source of income when it comes down to, you know, for the hospital. So now we're not doing surgeries. Now the nurses out on the medical surgical floor don't have, you know, patients, the ICU ultimately we're, we're taking care of rule outs. But even for us, it's very, very, you know, we're not managing DKA, we're not managing AFibbers anymore. Um, it was very odd how it was just like tumbleweeds just kind of blowing by. So the talk of furlough, of course, um, started to come up in the middle of a pandemic, which is really weird. <laughs> um, you know, because it was just kind of like, well, now what do we do? So furlough came up and of course we have to work really hard with our union members of how that's really going to work because um, a lot of our nurses expend, you know, expended their PTO to be able to be on low census. Um, uh, and a lot of people don't, they can't afford that PTO. Um, they've already made plans. They've already done things. There's, you know, some people have special needs, children, childcare, all sorts of stuff, you know, as everybody you know, has experienced with this pandemic, life ultimately changed. 
Um, so now here we are, we're furloughed. Luckily, our bargaining unit was able to get our facility to help with, um, you know, like the health care, the medical side of, you know, our benefits, but still, you know, PTO is still being burnt. So we're still trying to negotiate something with that, which has really been tough. But anyway, so that was probably about a month of furlough as it went down. Um, and then as we started seeing more cases come up and uh, more of the patients really kind of get in, you know, we were, we're bringing back our patient, our, um, our staff. Anyway, so then we had other things kind of happening in between where, in, you know, we're nurses in the community. We want to be able to educate everybody that, that we live with, our families, our friends, you know, hey, stay home, help, help mitigate this by, you know, doing your part, stay home. We have nurses that are posting on social media with their, you know, N95s trying to support that we don't have PPE because all these other bigger hospitals, such as New York, are needing PPE. So they are, in, in, in such, are reaching out to us to, you know, supply, help supply their PPE. Um, and so for us, that we're running low. So here we are trying to spread this message like stay home community you know we don't have PPE here and um you know I'm sorry but our facility they tried to reprimand us and say that that's ground for terminations um and you know overall we we understand the face of the hospital but we are a beacon of the community help you know we should be help helping the cause not just be shying away but no you know here our our union members are very strong about this um and we still continue to try to fight over this and it's still been an ongoing issue. It's, it's been like, oh, it's okay for the hospital to do this, but we cannot speak on our own terms, um, our own experiences. Um, some of us personally had to deal with our loved ones with COVID and we cannot speak of that, you know. Um, so anyway, and now currently, you know, we're not even experiencing our first wave and other parts of the country are experiencing their second wave and we're just kind of now getting a rise. Um, we're now having at least four to five patients in our ICU that are COVID positive. We now have our medical surgical floor that has dedicated four rooms out there um, for COVID positive patients. Um, and they are full, they are full. Um, we are trying to create another unit um, on our old, where we used to do on our chemotherapy and wound care. It's a 17 beds, I believe, 12 beds. Um, that is now being designated as a COVID ward and we're trying to, we're hiring, we're hiring travelers like crazy to be able to staff that right now. Um, the question is, is that safe? You know, is that really safe? Um, and how do we properly staff that, you know, to make sure that it is patient, you know, safe patient care that we're delivering. So, um, yeah, so it's, yeah. it's becoming a problem. So, and uh, just before I let, before I start asking you both questions, let me ask you a question just uh, for the audience who maybe is uh, nursing uh, familiar. I know we've got a lot of uh, healthcare workers on the call tonight. I, I, I'm scrolling through the list and see many uh, names that I recognize, but I'm also uh, seeing a lot of teachers and, and uh, uh, manufacturing workers, paper workers. Um, so when you say low census, you mean that the hospital said that you don't have enough patients here, so we're gonna send you home today. Or you're gonna have to take a, a, a one of your PTO days, is that right? That is correct, yeah. And ultimately that's our own, you know, that's our own expenditure, our own money, our own savings that it comes out with. Yes. So yes. And then the uh, the other question I wanted to ask you really quickly, Jessica, is um, you said that there's the cases are starting to spike a little bit in, in Hermiston. Where where's that coming from? Is uh, I know in a lot of places that as Judy was alluding to, there are essential workers that are still reporting, uh, and in these workplaces where people are working closely together, they turn they can sometimes turn into hot spots. Do you have that problem in Hermiston? What's going on out there? Yeah, absolutely, and it is mostly our essential workers. But here in our in rural Oregon. Um, we are mostly, you know, a, a trucking industry, agriculture industry, food processing, all sorts, um, migrant workers mostly as well. Um, so that's where we're really seeing a, a spike is in our factory type workings. Um, we have one facility in particular that's got over 100 cases alone. Mm -hmm. um, and we are seeing a lot of them. And, you know, and now that's just kind of like slowly spreading on to other hot spots now, so to speak. Got it. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that uh, extra detail. Um, I wanted to uh, we uh, wanted to encourage everybody in the audience. We're going to spend the next half hour doing Q and A. So if you have a question for um, 
uh, our panelists, please, you can drop it in the chat or you can put it in the uh, Q&A box. I'll be monitoring both of them. I guess um, one of the things that I wanted to get both of you to speak to, because I've heard this a lot, is, you know, things really aren't that bad here in Oregon. How serious is this virus? Uh, and my, uh, one of our um, uh, participants in the, the webinar even went so far as to say, what can we tell people who say this is a big hoax? How do we talk to people who don't really take this seriously? I wanted to get some frontline nurse advice. Uh, you know, what, what do we say to people to get them to take this seriously and recognize, uh, you know, that this is not the flu? Judy, you want to start? And then we'll go to Jessica. Sure. I mean, I mean, there's so much <coughs> live video recording of, of what it was like. Um, I know the New York Times has done several uh, video uh, short pieces and long pieces, 60 minutes. I mean, there's, there's, no, there's an endless supply of actual visits to hospitals, what, what it looks like, what people look like in these places. Um, I, I mean, people should just, those were not faked. <laughs> you can see nurses and doctors and what we were wearing, what we were doing and what we looked like, uh, the pictures of what our faces looked like wearing those masks all day. There's so much video and written documentation I think it's people's sense. I mean, I don't know how you talk to people who say that, but people don't want to believe something so horrible. It's very scary. And I think maybe trying to reach people from where their fear is, you know, yeah, this is really scary. What is life going to be like? I wish it wasn't like this. It's nothing you can see. It's not like a Godzilla walking down the street. <clears throat> this is a, an invisible virus. And it starts slow. And a lot of people don't get that sick. Um, so you kind of think like, maybe it won't hit me. I mean, we all thought that. We thought healthcare workers in particular, we think we're immortal. You know, we'll, we'll go, we go into fires, we go into disasters. I've gone after earthquake, earthquakes and hurricanes and, you know, mudslides. I thought nothing could touch me. I never saw anything like this in my life. Never, never, never. Uh, the amount of people that were coming in so sick, so quickly and succumbing so fast. And you just watched them die. You didn't know what to do for them all the things that we had learned to take care of people we, we had in our arsenal, none of it was working. You know, we mm. were reinventing things. We were, uh, people couldn't have their families with them. It was so tragic. I guess maybe just listening to somebody tell their story. Uh, mm. Certainly I, I could tell you, give you a lot of people to tell their stories. But mm. people thinking it's a hoax, I think it's their fear of, of, the, hor of the horrible. Jessica, you, uh, I, can, I don't want to stereotype Hermiston, but I might imagine that there are some folks there that are, uh, de they're definitely committed to not wearing their masks and maybe are a little dubious about whether this is a real thing. How do you handle it in your community? Well, you know, it's, it's really hard. It's just kind of continual education. And just as Judy was saying, it was, it's listening to other people who has, ex, who have experienced this. And most importantly, there, we're just kind of going, making this up as we go along. There is no, you know, real, real treatment for this. We're just kind of learning as we go. So for people to think that this is a hoax, this is a very dangerous hoax, if this is the case, you know, because we truly don't know what we're dealing with and how to deal with it, you know, because it's just, especially little hospitals, we have no resources. So for, you know, Hermiston, for people in Hermiston to believe that they, that they can't be touched and this is, you know, this will never be them. I'm sorry. It's just like, we are, you hope to please pray that this would never happen to you because this is the place that you don't want it to happen because we can't, we, there is nothing we can do for you because our facility does not have that capability. And if that is the case, we hope that we're able to take you to a place that has that capability. But right now, those other places, they're full. <laughs> so so. You, you raised something I did want to ask you about, particularly Jessica, where you are. I know in rural Oregon and rural America generally, one of the big problems is access to care and how far you have to travel for care. If, uh, if your hospital fills up and you can't admit any more patients because you don't have anywhere to put them, how far do people have to go before they can get a nut to a, the next closest uh, hospital or, you know, uh, acute care facility? You know, for another acute care, I mean, if we're filled up, that means those other little hospitals, such as the one right next to us, which is about, about 35 minutes away from us, is probably filled. 
There's another hospital about an hour from us, but the bigger hospitals like OHSU and Legacy, those are about four to five hours away from us. And that's a car drive. So of course that's gonna be a helicopter drive, you know, ride for you, um, which is a pretty good bill for just for a ride. So unfortunately. Right, right. Well, thank you for answering that question. I've got a, a question um, of one of our uh, participants, um, Tracy Thompson. I'm gonna uh, unmute you. Go ahead and ask your question, Tracy. Uh, yes, so I am part of SEIU and a state worker and our governor has declared in Oregon that everyone must wear masks inside and out unless you're a state worker. She doesn't think that it's important that state workers wear masks while we are reporting to work in our buildings because it's not open to the public and quote unquote, it's not retail. To me, that's a big joke, um, a bad joke. And I'm wanting to organize, but at this point, this is so new. I have no idea how to organize people um, when you can't go to their cubicle and talk to them and we can't march on the Capitol, which we're two buildings away from the state Capitol. How, how do we organize people? And we also, we can't use the state resources. So if anybody has any suggestions, because it's absolutely baloney that because we're state workers, we should not be required to wear masks. When everyone else in the world, I mean, in, in the state is. Thank you for your question, Tracy. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, let Judy start since I know you guys have had a few uh, instances of trying to uh, engage in some direct action to change policy at your places. How did you guys organize? I mean, it, most of us being sheltered at home, it's hard to imagine uh, what organizing even looks like in, under COVID. Uh, can you give Tracy and others some advice? Sure. If you have access uh, as a union to people's personal information, um, you can uh, enroll, you know, you can set up a Facebook page. We, we set up uh, closed Facebook pages in all of our, all of our structures, um, you know, with rules, uh, but they were closed. I mean, of course, people could copy and paste, but it was a, a place where people could share information. And that was how we got people to get on the Zoom call, uh, organize the Zoom calls, contact people, text messaging, something called hustling. Hustling is a way of sending text messages to a lot of people. We found most people look at their text messages more than their emails. Um, and we started off with seven people, nine people, 12 people, 300 in a week or two, we got uh, people on board. Uh, you know, the outrage of being treated differently, your life doesn't matter, uh, but other people's do, that's outrageous. This is a, this is a, a potentially fatal disease. Uh, that's, they have blood on their hands. Uh, and then once you're able to just communicate, uh, you can have social distancing, mask wearing rallies. Uh, we started doing that. We kept six feet apart. And some, in the beginning, we had like a rope with six feet apart and we kind of made lines with our rope, with our signs up. We called media, we called press conference. The press loves these things. We were able to be a media magnet um, and you have a good argument. You make the homemade signs, you know, every other worker's protected, but not state workers. Uh, we're not robots, we're human, we're susceptible, you know, whatever slogans you want to come up with, make the demand. The pressure we found, bad media, big pressure, organizing uh, pretty much got us every step of the way. We had to fight every step of the way, but issue after issue after issue after issue, organizing got us what we needed. Uh, mm -hmm. The fight doesn't stop, you know, they get amnesia, they do it again, but uh, it was very effective. Um, I just wanted to also flag for folks who are on their computers and can watch the chat. Um, one of the things that you're that makes what you're telling us, Tracy, so um, uh, particularly disturbing is that the science is emerging very clearly now that the risk of airborne transmission is very real, particularly in indoor settings like where you work. Uh, so the idea that just because it's not open to the public that somehow you're not at risk, especially in a state that is doing so little testing uh, is unconscionable. Um, but uh, now, um, NISNA, the, the Judy's Union, was a very early a proponent of airborne transmission. I just shared a, a fact sheet that they produced back in April. And now, guess what? After four or five months of saying 
uh, this is only droplet per cup. You know, it only can be spread by the coughing and the, you know, the, the visible droplets that people sneeze. Uh, maybe not. Maybe it can actually be airborne. Uh, and um, so uh, you're absolutely right to fight for that. And, um, you know, as uh, Lisa is uh, uh, pointing out in the chat as well, um, this risk is even higher, not just because of the testing, but because of the fact that so many people don't show any signs uh, of the virus. They don't get sick. There's no symptoms. Uh, you have between 20 and 50% of the people who contract the virus who, who, who aren't showing any signs. Um, Jessica, any advice uh, for Tracy or others who are, who are dealing with this double standard? Yeah, um, I mean, a lot of the same thing what Judy says, just coming together and really fighting and um, just getting your name out there. Um, I know our union has worked very closely together. Uh, we have a, a lot of representatives, to, to, you know, within our facilities between each unit um, or each department rather. And um, yeah, we meet sometimes twice a week and we're demanding meetings. And even though it's a hard fight, we do see progress. They're not really making any policy changes. Um, no, needless to say, I mean, they kind of are, but it's only when we say something. So unless you really stand up to say something, that's not, you know, you're not gonna expect a change to happen unless you actually rise up and come together. Great, thanks so much. Um, I'm curious, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about what's been happening in hospitals and in healthcare. And while it's really egregious, it sounds to me, Jessica, that they would be proposing layoffs uh, or furloughs, quote unquote, like using uh, some technicality to get around your contract uh, in the middle of a pandemic. Um, you know, still employment in healthcare sectors, probably, uh, you know, you guys have some job security for the time being. Um, what about for uh, others in your community? What has this looked like for Judy and Jessica both? How has the, um, the economic collapse, uh, really the biggest economic collapse since the Great Depression, looked like where you are? And um, what have you uh, as a union or, or, you know, as individual act union activists been doing to try and support uh, folks in your community who've been really struggling, as you alluded to both? Well, I know for yeah. us here in Hermiston, it's, um, you know, just trying to really make sure that people are going to be safe when we're opening up, you know. Um, there has, we've had a rally early, I want to say it was May, I want, it was when we, when the, our economy started to open, but it, was a bunch of people or activists, needless to say, that got together, were demanding that the economy open back up. And this is before Kate Brown had, you know, kind of released her thing. Um, but on the other side of town, there was also another rally going on um, that was doing the social distancing and just kind of just doing their part and saying, okay, we understand that you want to open up. We understand that you guys need to go back to work. We understand, you know, because this is an agriculture-based community. There are a lot of people that really highly depend on the schools, their work systems, um, you know, just to get, be able to get meals and such like that. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's kind of a coming together and just hoping that everybody is doing their part and to ensure safety. Judy, what have you guys been doing to try and uh, bridge the gap or bridge the, bridge the distance between where, you know, hospital and healthcare workers are and, uh, and the rest of the, the workforce, especially those of us out of work? Well, we, uh, you know, we have a legislative program and also uh, working in coalition with community organizations and with other unions, raising funds to feed people, uh, demanding that rent, uh, cancel rent, cancel debt, uh, so that people are not evicted, so people do not get foreclosed from their homes, so that there's enough food, uh, expanding uh, unemployment, and of course, the ultimate thing is, ta you know, getting laws to tax the rich so that we have enough funds. Uh, there are people, you know, evaluating what we spend on military spending and other spending, uh, the CEO salaries, all these kinds of things to reconfigure the way we spend our money because what good is a government or a society if it allows its people to starve and die and become homeless? What, what does that say about our civilization? Uh, so, uh, you know, this is a wake-up call for all of us to think about what kind of society we live in and what kind of society we want to build. And I, I, the, the amount of money that these rich people have when you start looking at budgets, uh, learning to under, understand what budgets are, I, it's, it's, my, it's beyond our comprehension, that level of wealth 
uh, but we certainly see that level of poverty. If you look at the statistics, they're overwhelming, they're mind boggling. Uh, so we, we build those coalitions. Uh, we have a lot of uh, elected leaders on our side. We're able to actually get very progressive leaders elected. Uh, so we used our credibility as nurses and as caregivers that people depend on and respect to also put forward a very radical agenda uh, because we can't stand by and watch people die. It's just not okay. So that's, that's what we're pushing. The okay. Life, not death. <laughs> and it is coming down to that in, in a lot of instances. Um, I wanted to thank uh, everybody who's chiming in. Um, there's uh, one very specific question and very, one very general question. I'll take the specific one early, which is um, uh, in a lot of places um, when COVID is hitting, it appears that it is causing a lot of financial distress, particularly for small community hospitals like where you work, Jessica. Uh, I was curious, um, are you, either one of you seeing um, threats of closures, hospitals closing, uh, is this, are we at risk of losing some of our critical healthcare infrastructure as a result of the economic collapse caused by COVID or just because of uh, other, you know, um, for-profit healthcare behavior? What's going on here? Well, I know for our hospital specifically, it's a lot of been hush-hush. Um, they don't really tell us a whole lot of what's going on, but I can tell you that, you know, like our CEO is retiring, our DNS is retiring, so there's a lot of change happening. We do have neighboring hospitals like in Yakima that was supposed to be closed down, but then of course the midst of the pandemic has come and now they've reopened, but now, but there's still kind of question about, okay, but what happens after? So, you know, I, I think it's just kind of like, we, we always know there's something, we just never know what that is. We're, we're the kind of like the little ones um, down there. And I know that when it comes down to budget, we're kind of always the first to be kind of shut down. In our community specifically, I know they depend on us very highly for the, you know, for the resources that we do offer. But that's not to say, um, you know, we have a town that's just probably about an hour south of us is Hefner and, you know, who knows what could do this to this hospital um, or another hospital just like that. So, yeah, I mean, it's pretty detrimental, so to speak. What's the scene like in New York, Judy? Well, I think this situation is a real indictment of our healthcare system, if, if nothing ever, if nothing else ever was. And there's three very significant ways in which it is. Um, we have a for-profit healthcare system that is not the way it is in many other countries who are able to handle this situation much better than we do. The first issue is that we have no healthcare, public healthcare infrastructure. In other words, it's not profitable, they don't do it. It's not profitable to have storages of the PPE. It's not pro profitable to have a storage of ventilators. It's not profitable to have uh, an empty ward uh, to accommodate sick patients. It's not profitable to have people trained, ready to go, but not necessarily going. It's like if you had a um, security guard who is constantly arresting people, breaking into the building, uh, that's, what they, that's what they expect in healthcare. The, you know, they're, they're there to be ready, right? We're not ready. We're not ready like that. We don't have anything like that because it's not profitable for that to happen. It's a breakneck speed, making money, marketing, competing. So what's happening now is they're threatening to close hospitals as they have. Um, they're, the whole for-profit issue is why people got sent home so quickly. Used to be people would stay a week for a surgical procedure. Now you're lucky if you're there for an hour. And the care that you get at home, I mean, families are now taking care of patients instead of professionals. You know, this whole trend has really harmed us. And with a disease like this, not having the capability to sustain the patients, uh, the understaffing, the lack of space, it resulted in death. It's a, it's a killing system. So it's not a healing system. It's not a prepared system. And when your uh, health care is linked to your employer and then you're laid off and you have no health care, that's the third indictment of the current system. It should not be built around employment. It should be prepared for disasters and it should be, be uh, built around healing people, not making money. All those things contributed to death, to negative outcomes, to the uh, services they're trying to close. Now that everybody's depressed and jumping out of windows because they're so going crazy, they want to cut mental health services. Uh, people are still having babies. They want to cut obstetrics. There are children. They want to cut pediatrics. They want to cut all the things except for CAT scans and endoscopies and uh, surgical procedures. 
that make money. Uh, that's not what healthcare is. Healthcare, we became nurses and doctors and caregivers to heal people, not to rip them off. Uh, so I think that the biggest issue is to have a different kind of a healthcare system that is a uh, right, uh, that everyone has free healthcare uh, who needs it and access to it and that it's quality care. Thanks. Yes. And what you were talking about, um, uh, Jessica, earlier, just the sort of competition for PPE, that's another uh, sort of manifestation of what Jude's talking about, the chaos between the systems. You know, the fact that it's not uh, integrated or coordinated and we're certainly not prepared. Um, so uh, we've got about 10 minutes left. I want to make sure we can cover as many questions as we can. I know uh, that at least two of our participants have asked this, so I want to make sure to ask you and get your perspective. Uh, the, the not million, this is the million dollar question, then we'll hit the trillion dollar question in a minute. Uh, the million dollar question is, uh, is it safe to reopen schools in the fall? We've had several people ask us from frontline healthcare workers perspective, what should we be doing to make sure that we don't put teachers in the uh, position that you guys have been in, uh, in, in the recent months? So uh, uh, Jessica, why don't you go first and then I'll let Judy chime in. Well, I mean, that's a tough one. It really, really is. Um, I can tell you, for me personally, I have elected to homeschool my children. Um, and, you know, and it's not even necessarily the health side of things. For me, I made the decision because of the educational benefit for my children, um, to be honest. There's a lot of change happening within our community, within the society, within the structure of everything that we're doing anymore, the way we touch things for, you know, like there's just so much change. And for my children to be, you know, having to experience all this change from something that they, they were so used to doing, they, they're, they're going to be told not to be able to do anymore. Um, and of course, I want to be able to protect the teachers because I am a frontline health worker um, who is mostly exposed. So therefore, I feel like my family is also being mostly exposed. Um, we are considered high risk for that. So I want to be able to keep everybody safe. Um, so educationally, do I think it's healthy? Probably not. <laughs> Um, as well as there is a risk associated for these children to go back to school. I do. Mm -hmm. Well, and not to mention all of the parents who have been pulling their hair out trying to be primary educator, primary breadwinner, and living in It is so hard. Yes, I agree. There's a lot of change happening. This is what I'm talking about. Like, right. even myself, I'm all like, I don't know if I'm ready for this. <laughs> right. I think uh, many people are dreading uh, the, the, the Labor Day weekend restart. Judy, what about you? What's your opinion? <laughs> Uh, well, I think that if we had, again, a, 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 a just like healthcare, education is supposed to not be profit, but we see a big difference between the private schools and the public schools. I just read an article today that the private schools who are well funded have created uh, smaller classes with spacing, uh, with resources, and they probably will be able to open safely. They can keep kids at distance. They can um, provide masks mask wearing and social distancing when indoors with enough outdoor recreation, certainly in this time period, um, and making sure that people are not sick, having temperature checks, things like that. Uh, you could open schools as long as you're not having a surge. They just uh, revealed that in Florida, where there's a big surge, something like 30%, over 30% of the children are testing positive. Now, maybe they're not getting sick, although there are some very serious things that can happen to children this inflammatory Coxsackie's kind of syndrome that we're seeing in some of our kids, but they're transmitters, they're vectors. They're like typhoid Marys to their grandparents or to any relative who might be more susceptible. So uh, that is really dangerous. Uh, dangerous potentially for some small, small percentage of the children, but certainly as a transmitter without even showing symptoms. So if our educational system was built differently, if they would take over factories where people aren't working and convert them into classrooms. Uh, if you look at some of what they've done all over the country, they have glass partitions, they have curtains, they have spacing, they have masks. Uh, they make sure that people aren't crowding hallways. They have protections and schools could be open. You know, even the school buses with spacing and distancing and keeping windows open. There are ways to be protected. If you, there was an experiment they did that was on television. Um, I feel like I'm saying as seen on TV. Uh, with these Petri dishes where people wore masks and didn't wear masks. And they did five things. The first thing was 
speaking softly, speaking softly at a distance to the Petri dish. Uh, the person with the mask, there was nothing on the dish. The person who spoke softly, who had no mask on, just a tiny, maybe a little something. Then speaking loudly, you saw more with the non-masked person. Mask person, nothing. Uh, then it was singing. Singing, you even saw more uh, organisms in the Petri dish. Mask person, nothing. Shouting, way more. And finally, uh, coughing and then sneezing. Sneezing, it looked like disgusting. You know, it looked like, you know, mold, mold on your wall when you took a shower and you never you washed it. You're a nurse, Judy, so disgusting. <laughs> Must really be bad. <laughs> uh, but but so you, you know that wearing a mask uh, actually doesn't protect you as much as it protects somebody else. But everyone wearing a mask, very effective. Covering your nose, covering your mouth, wearing a mask, that works, um, unless the mask gets really wet and soiled. So mask wearing is probably even more important than washing your hands. I mean, you should wash your hands. I'm a nurse, I can't say that's not important. But wearing a mask is critical. Outdoors, at a distance, not that bad. Uh, walking outdoors when nobody's around, obviously you don't have to wear a mask, but if you get close to people, what I do when I go outside, if I'm not near anyone, I have my mask under my chin. As soon as somebody's 20 feet away, I pull, I pull up my mask and wear it. Um, that's safe functioning. Indoors is harder. One of the reasons we're seeing it worse, I think, in the South now is in the winter, uh, people could be outside in the South. We were inside getting really sick. Now we're more outside in, in our area and people in the south are probably more inside with these air conditioned environments, plus the, 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 the disbelief that this is something serious. But I think opening schools is very dangerous unless all the provisions that I mentioned were, were to be implemented. Right, well, to be continued, the, the debate uh, is raging here in Oregon and uh, be exciting to see how it uh, unfolds. Um, last two questions, to, uh, we'll hit the trillion dollar question just so we don't miss it, how long before we can expect to see, or will we ever see a vaccine for this virus? What is the, what is the odds from the healthcare workers? <laughs> Jessica, you wanna go first? I mean, I think we're all bet. hopeful. <laughs> I think we're all hopeful, you know. Um, I hope that we do, definitely. How long? Gosh, I don't know, but I hope soon because I think we're all kind of like ready. But yes. um, yeah, but we all know it takes time and it takes studies. And I really, you know, we need to do it safely. We need to make sure that the evidence is in place and that, you know, we're, we're taking the necessary steps. So I think that's, that's the main importance of that. I mean, I know the government is really trying to push to get this vaccine uh, to be made and then put out as quickly as possible. Um, but, you know, as a healthcare worker, I always, I, I got it think about, you know, and as an ICU nurse, I got to think two steps ahead about, well, what's going to happen in the future related to these vaccines, um, potentially, um, or, you know, even in anything. So um, I just hope if we do it, and when we do it, we do it in a manner that's safely, um, just as all things should. <laughs> Judy, how about you? Yeah, I don't think we're going to have a safe vaccine for a while. Um, There's some different uh, scientific avenues that are being followed, one built around antibodies, another built around the organism that they attenuate, that they weaken. Um, they're doing some, you know, the testing stages now. Um, but, uh, you know, those things really do take time. And the coronavirus typically, coronavirus is, common cold is a coronavirus. There's a lot of different coronaviruses. They tend to mutate. That's a tendency of coronaviruses. This one, we don't know yet. There's so much we don't know. Uh, so, people who even have antibodies, we're not even sure how long they last. I know people who have uh, been negative, but they were positive, been positive, but they were negative. The antibodies uh, were positive and then they lost their antibodies. So we don't even know how long it could last. Uh, but one good way to get rid of the virus is to do the social distancing, wear the mask, not have new infections, and the virus has nowhere to go. It has to have a human being who is susceptible, who is there, who is inheriting the virus to get sick. If we had done the right thing in March, by mid-April, we could have been normal. But this country failed us miserably. And I think, I hope everybody is aware of that. We would not be having the hardships that we have right now had we done the right thing, had we learned from China and from uh, Italy and Spain. They warned us. They said, don't, don't let this happen to you. And we 
did the same thing for the rest of the country in, in the Northeast. He said, please don't make the mistakes they did here. But people didn't listen. Right. We're paying that price. Well, I'm not going to let the, I'm not going to let our meeting end on that note. I wanted to ask you both uh, last words, which was, um, we've seen some amazing uh, organizing uh, in very difficult times throughout this uh, period, uh, especially by frontline healthcare workers. How can we take the energy uh, that you guys have displayed uh, and sort of spread that uh, into other parts of the labor movement and inspire more workers to join union? What do you think uh, uh, we can do to help actually uh, come out of this very difficult experience a stronger uh, more powerful uh, union movement. We'll end on that one. Jessica, you want to go first? Oh, sure. Why not? Um, I think, you know, for us as union workers, this is a very, very, you know, passionate topic because this is our community. It's our health. It's everything that we are. So um, this is a passion of ours. So we're going to take the energy and we're going to enforce that everybody be safe. Um, so I think it's important for everybody else to understand that it's, you know, if it's not for yourself, do it for your grandmother, do it for that person that, you know, can't fight this disease, um, or in any case and whatever it is that you need to advocate for, this is all about advocating for what we believe in. Um, and that's what the union is all about. And that's what our union is about. Our union is coming together. We're fighting for what the nurses need. Um, we're, we're demanding that our hospital take care of us. Um, we are demanding that the community is aware of what's happening in our hospital um, that they're trying to shy, you know, to shy away from. Um, but we need it. We need that to be publicly known. And so, whether that's energy or advocacy or just passion, whatever it is, you know, find that find that why behind that, and, and you know, of what it is and why you want to do that. I know for me, you know, I know for me, I grew up here. This is I did. I've lived here my whole entire life. My whole family is here. I'm advocating for them. This means so much for me. I have lost people from, you know, that I love dearly from this virus. So I know it's important and I, I'm doing it for them. So. so Judy, final words. Yeah. I, you know, our phones are ringing off the hook uh, after we started fighting for our rights and the rights of all healthcare workers and all essential workers that were not in our union uh, for our communities. Uh, the nurses throughout the state started calling us and wanting to join. We've had a few elections since then. Uh, we are we have a lot of popularity. People when people realize that they're like the worker from the state sector. When your boss tells you you don't need a mask, you don't. Uh, you know you know who your friends are. Your friend is not your boss. Your friend is not your government. Your friend is your union. Your friend are your colleagues. Your friend are your coworkers. And together, you're the ones who are going to make a difference. And when people are facing life versus death and they see death is nothing, I don't do anything, life is I join a union uh, and then I have a chance. This is a life and death issue and that really pushes people over the edge. So we have a lot more popularity and particularly when unions take on social issues uh, and protect people who are not their members like fighting for single payer health care. We already have health benefits. I don't pay for my health benefits, but a lot of people do and a lot of people don't have them. That I'm fighting for them, that makes people feel, well, I really, I, like, I respect your union. I, I, I love what you're doing. I, I, that makes sense to me. I think unions should go back to their roots uh, from the last century and fight for social justice for everyone. Uh, and that more people will want to join then. We had the highest rates of unionization in the 30s when all the union fights were about uh, the public, social security, uh, workers' compensation, health and safety regulations that affected everybody. That's what makes unions popular and what grows the union movement. Very well said. Uh, thank you all for being here uh, in our inaugural summer series. Thanks everyone at the Oregon AFL-CIO and my colleagues at the Labor Education Research Center. Thank you, Judy Gonzalez, President of New York State Nurses Association, Jessica Barnes, uh, Oregon Nurses Association in Hermiston for being here and giving us so much knowledge and wisdom. Uh, we'll see you in two weeks. I dropped the link in the uh, chat, so please sign up for all our series. We really would love to have you back uh, and uh, get out there and organize. Thank you, everybody. Good night.